Thank you for your presence here at Malcolm X this afternoon, the uh, Karnak Wellness Institute, and we're here to hear none other than our most very beloved and precious uh, Guru Maji, Dr. Gloria Peace, speak this afternoon. My name is Makeda Cheryl Baker, flew in yesterday from South Carolina to be here, especially with you, 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 and you this afternoon, and I am so very honored and so very pleased to, again, not only be in your presence, but to be allowed to pour libations as this process becomes underway. Uh, for those of us who know or who may not know that the libation in traditional Africa is a recognition of the ancestors. It is a recognition of those who came before us. And in African society, a traditional African society, life exists on three levels. There is the existence of those who came before us, those who are within the ground. There is the existence of those of us who walk on top of the ground. And then there is the existence of those who are yet to come. Therefore, in traditional African society, again, life exists on all three levels. And it is incumbent upon us to remember those whose paths we walk in, to remember those who have gone before us. Um, again, the libation is the calling forth of the ancestors, the calling forth of their spirit. It is the asking, not only of their presence, but of their approval of this gathering. Therefore, right now, we acknowledge their lives. We acknowledge the sacrifices that they made on behalf of us, that we may stand and walk where we stand. All of the sacrifices they made in the name of America. I'm going to ask everyone to please stand for just one moment, please. As we begin, I'm going to ask each and every one of us to please call out at least one name of a member of your family, a member of your kin who has gone on before you. I'll start with the name of my beloved mother, Maggie B. Mobley. Please call out the name or names of those who have gone before you. Yes, in the name of all of those, we say libation. Right now, we call upon those ancestors who were stolen from the birthplace of humanity from the African continent. On their behalf, we pour this libation. Right now, we call upon those who were forced into the bowels of those ships that took them from the birthplace of humanity on their behalf we pour this libation right now we call upon those who were enslaved in the americas and throughout the diaspora we pour this libation right now we call upon those who were beaten into submission as their culture their history and their language was taken from them. On their behalf, we pour this libation. Amen. Right now, we call upon those who were forced to bear children, but were permanently separated from those children. We pour this libation. Right now, we call upon those who were degraded and dehumanized and given a non-existent status on their behalf we pour this libation. Amen. Right now, we pour libation for all those who bore the brunt of all the racisms, the hatred, and man's inhumanity to man. We pour this libation. 
We must not forget in whose footsteps we walk. We must not forget those who came before us. We must not forget those whose paths we now walk in. On behalf of all those who made it in spite of when they couldn't make it because of. On behalf of all those who bore the name calling, who bore the indecencies, who bore the degradations, that we may stand and walk where we stand and walk where we walk, we pour this libation. On behalf of Africa herself, who birthed humanity, we pour this libation. May we say libation. Hotel. You may be seated. Before we bring uh, Dr. Peace up, we want to just say thank you. Uh, my name is Gino Brooks, and I'm the proud president of Malcolm and Scholars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I guess she starts to get going. I want to say thank you for being here this evening, and you did a beautiful, beautiful libation. And it's so important that we do that, and we do it at every car night. And every time I think about my mother, I think about Fannie Lou Hamer, I think about Kwame Ture, I think about Sacred Ture, Kwame Nkrumah, I think about all these great giants, Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, I mean the list goes on and on. And we have to, we have to give acknowledgement to this. And I think about my mama and these folks because we have to think, and that's why I'm, we have to think about them because Dr. Peace is so important. Before we even started Kana, she invited us on. Dr. Ibram is very close to her. And we had even conceived it in terms of all the workshops and all of the great people that have been here to give us their mother wit and that wisdom that we're going to get today. So I'm so happy and I just had to say a few words, particularly thank you to Dr. Peace for opening up. She heard the concept and she thought it was just so wonderful and so beautiful. She has a program on uh, cable network and she could have, she talks about everything and anything, but it's all positive things. And so she gave us that opportunity to present Karnak and ever since it's flourished. We've had great sessions every Saturday, great people, and now the mother of Karnak is here. So let's have a great presentation. Let's give her a great welcome and to thank her for being here today. Let's welcome Dr. Peace. I don't have a microphone. Where is it? It's on me. Thank you for your invitation to the Chronic Wellness Institute to discuss mother wit, minding and mending family ties. I'm a little bit uh, overwhelmed. First of all, Makeda Cheryl Baker was one of my students, now my daughter. And for her to do what she did here today is just such a pleasure to see that she has continued to follow the culture and to be true to her African origin. 
President Gaynor Brooks, Dr. Leonard Ingram, who slipped in on me. I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. I've thought a lot about it. I've done a lot of review. I probably have too much to say, and I'll try not to bore you. But I do know that this is a group of people who know how to pay attention because I see many people from the House of Ra. And I know that attention and awareness is foremost upon the disciplines that you learn at the House of Ra. So I feel certain that even though I'm going to be slow and methodical um, and sometimes maybe a little tedious, it's so important to me that we deliver what we need to deliver to each other on those occasions that we have time to come together and deliberate over serious matters. And nothing could be more serious than minding and mending family ties. So we opened our program with a theme song from OmniU Presents the H3O Art of Life show, the television show that I host and produce. Umoja comes from the Seven Principles CD that was composed and is performed by Kwame Steve Cobb and his beautiful wife, Shavan Duka, who are others of my spiritual children, who allow me to use their music every time with no royalties being paid. So we opened that, opened with that because it's important that we frame our discussion with the lyrics of that song. The pouring of libation is a traditional African ceremony by which we acknowledge the presence of our ancestors and we beseech them to empower us to seek and to speak the truth on behalf of our community, the living, the dead, and the yet unborn. So we open our program with Umoja. Umoja meaning unity. Once upon a time, we had our land, our culture, and our mind. Surely we had tribes, but we all lived right there in Africa. Things began to change. There were forces that divided us spread throughout the world, we seem unsure about our heritage. Umoja is the message, a call for unity. For a long, long time, we've been fooled by the illusion, called by different names, and this has served to just confuse us. When all is said and done, to be one is our revolution. We never stand alone because unity's our resolution. Umoja is the message, a call for unity. Let us share one mind through a vision of our future. While we're joining hands to form a circle around our motherland, from all around the world, she is calling home her children. Our minds will take us there, and we will celebrate our union. Umoja is the message, a call for unity. In this, what I hope will be a brief summary, I expect to provide operational definitions to key concepts that are relevant to the topic mother wit, minding and mending family ties, and to depose twistory, a contrived assortment of fabrications masquerading as history, and to replace twistory with history as defined by Kiari T.H. Sheetwood in the book edited by him called The Race. According to Cheatwood, history is a living continuity and as such, history represents the facts of life as witnessed by the people who lived it, who are living it, 
and who will live it. Let us begin with the definition of family. Family, a collective noun, descendants of a common ancestor. There seem to be various choices offered for ancestral sources. Among them are divine, the Egyptians held that view, human, the ancient Africans such as the Zulu people held that view, animal, that view was held by Charles Darwin in the origin of the species. Then there are latest offering is autonomous beings. That's the theory of Stephen Hawking's and Leonard M. Lodina, the new book that they have out now called The Grand Design. To give you time to deliberate on the issue of our common ancestor, I invite you to join me in a review of African family history as typified by the Zulus of South Africa whom I will now recite. The prim primary source of my information is ancestor Dr. Elkin T. Satole. You would remember him, Makeda, yeah. who was one of my professors, one of your professors, and later he became my colleague at Northeastern Illinois University's Jacob H. Carruthers Center for Inner City Studies in Chicago, Illinois. I wanted to begin close to the beginning because this provides one of the oldest and clearest examples of holistic family organization. And as such, it enables us to compare who we have been to the fragmented survival units. This is what Francis Welsing calls what we have today. Survival units to which we are insidiously being reduced. This process will enable us to consider whether or not there is something we may need to sand Kofa to go back and fetch. Holistic family organization as exemplified by Africans in general, the Zulus of South Africa and the Kikuyu of East Africa in particular is inclusive rather than exclusive. Furthermore, it is not based solely on biology geography, or gender. We refrain from using the term extended family because in this context, it is an oxymoron, a concept composed of mutually exclusive terms. Other examples of oxymorons are ill health, civil war, freedom fighter, and perhaps good job. <laughs> this contrivance is applicable, if at all, only to the nuclear family model. That is a family that lives together in one household. It is not relevant to our present discussion, so we do not use extended family. Likewise, we avoid the term race, because according to our ancestor, Dr. John Henry Clark, race is a fraudulent concept. The holistic family consists of descendants of a common ancestor, period. Holistically speaking, to state that the family is not based solely on biology is to assert that there can be no such concepts as outside children or childless marriages, especially when marriage is viewed from a holistic African perspective. Marriage is the union of families, not merely the joining together of this man and this woman. This man and this woman are never seen as individuals, but as members of the respective families who are, who are joining together to form a more perfect union in the process of being united in holy matrimony. Therefore, this man and this woman are not the only ones who are responsible for the success of the marriage. The members of both families have a vested interest in perpetuating this sacred union. The continuity of their way of life, 
that is to say their history and their culture, culture is inextricably bound to the preservation of marriage, that is to say, family ties. As you ponder the number of so-called in-laws one might acquire as a result of the union of families, let us consider the relationship between family members as they relate to the young descendants of the common ancestor. Earlier, we stated that holistic family organization, as exemplified by the Zulu people, is not based solely on gender. By that, we mean that roles of the family are not determined by gender. Each role is dependent on function. The fathers of the family function as the protectors and the disciplinarians of the family. It is their responsibility to teach the sons what it means to be a family member, as well as what their various roles in the family are expected to be as they grow into maturity. The mothers of the family are regarded as the nurturers who are at liberty to be a tad indulgent in their relationship with the young. It is likewise the mother's responsibility to teach the daughters what are their varying family roles as they too grow into maturity. Parenthood based on function allows for male mothers, which are known to the Zulu as malume and female fathers who are called Babakazi. Today, I am Malume and Babakazi and all of those, and so are you. The family fathers are the brothers as well as the sisters of the biological father. When Dr. Satoli explained this to me, I was fascinated and I had an opportunity to see an example of that in, in operation. There was a death in the family and one of his sisters came here from South Africa. And when she first came, she came and she was cordial and kind and, and endearing to the children of the family. But after a few days, he reported, she began to question the mother so how are the children doing? And the mother said, oh, this one doesn't do his homework, and this one is always getting late for something, and this, she was explaining the uh, various problems that she was having with the children. The female father, the sister of Dr. Elton, Elkin Satole, took it upon herself to discipline the children. Now, she came all the way from South Africa to South Shore, and put the children in order because she, too, was a father of those children, a mother of her own children, but a father to her brother's children because all of the sisters and brothers of the father are fathers. The family mothers are the sisters and brothers of the biological mother. Now, I know people say, I can't be mother and father to the children. No, you shouldn't be mother and father to the same children. If you are a female, you are mother to your children. But to your brother's children, you are father. So twistery has made us fit into these gender-based roles as though they were ordained from on high. We are Sankofa. We are going back to fetch. The fathers and mothers all share equal responsibility along with the bio biological mothers and fathers for the children's welfare. Holistic family relationships are undergirded by reciprocity and sons and daughters share equal responsibility for the parents and or when or should they become dependent or elderly. Now, I just love that right there because I visited someone who was a friend of mine in a nursing home. That could not happen in a holistic family organization. 
because all of the children are responsible for all of the elders, just as all of the elders are responsible for all of the children. And it would never come a time unless everybody was completely wiped out. There would never come a time when an elder would need to be taken care of by strangers. Since all of the siblings of the biological mothers and fathers may also be mothers and fathers of their own children, each has the opportunity to serve in the capacity of both mother and father simultaneously. Needless to say, all of the children of brothers and sisters are themselves brothers and sisters. So the children of brothers and sisters are brothers and sisters. That means that the children that you are calling your nieces and nephews are your children. And the children that your children are calling cousins are their brothers and sisters. Can you see the unity, the bonding, that comes just from the way the family is organized. In addition, I want to point out that the family ties are further strengthened because the sons and daughters are initiated along with members of their age grade. And therefore, they become social brothers and sisters. Now, I know we have graduations from high school and graduations from this but we don't have initiation rights. And so we don't initiate the young people of the same age grade together into a relationship in which they recognize each other as brothers and sisters. Maybe the closest we come to that is with the fraternities and sororities, where those people and those organizations seem to regard themselves in some sort of kinship relationship. But it's very important to understand that Africans went all out to every extent to make certain that everyone was included in the family in every way possible. Natural kinship bonds were buttressed by the addition of social bonds. And so it is obvious that there weren't any orphans. How can you be an orphan? All your mother's sisters are your mothers. How can you be an orphan? All your father's brothers are your fathers. How can you be an orphan? How can you be a ward of the state? And I'm told that there are now school zones, President uh, Brooks, that are called no parent zones, where none of the children in the school is living at home or claimed by are in the custody of their own biological parents, but they are wards of the state. It's a sad thing. It is equally apparent that there's no aid to dependent children in such an arrangement, and social security is vested in the family. Now, as you contemplate the number of grandparents and great-grandparents that can result from this holistic family organization, try to avoid making calculations regarding the exponential increase that would be engendered by the practice of polygyny, multiple marriages. Now you've got another set, set of parents. You've got another set of mothers. You've got another set of mothers' sisters who are mothers or you may have another set of fathers and another set of father's brothers who are fathers. It's very important that we understand that African people were born in unity. They lived in holistic relationships, and their relationships were defined by unity. Unity was reflected in every aspect of their way of life. To speak holistically of culture, is to speak simultaneously of the family, while in the same breath, to speak of the family is to speak of the community. Have you thought of that word? Have you analyzed that word? Common unity. Descendants of one ancestor. These concepts are not really synonymous. They're not mutually exchanged with each other. 
They represent what I'm calling a holistic trinity, the family, the culture, and the community. They are all one. I want to read to you again the lyrics of the song because it's important to me that this be emphasized throughout this presentation. Once upon a time, we had our land, our culture, and our mind. Surely we had tribes, but we all lived right there in Africa. Things began to change. There were forces that divided us, spread throughout the world. We seem unsure about our heritage. Let's talk a little bit about the forces that divided us. One of the forces, the primary, the principal force, was what I, what I call the ACT, the Atlantic Cap Captive Trade. This is to historically referred to as a slave trade. Very important that we make a distinction between captives yeah. and slaves. Yeah. I'm going to refer to my own statement that I made some time ago about this because I have always said that if we could strike but one blow in the struggle for liberation, it should be to debunk the notion that slaves were brought out of Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The real deal is that untold millions yeah. of free black people yeah. were dispossessed of their ancestral land yeah. and forced into captivity. The real deal is that the, that the survivors of this ma'afa which I think is the show enough Holocaust, have been subjected to a system of cultural deprivation, and the, we are being effectively transformed from African captives into Negro slaves. Slavery is a process. It's not an event. It takes a long time to turn an African captive into a Negro slave. The second thing is the, the second force that divides us is the force of cultural deprivation. Years ago, when I was in the graduate program at Northeastern Illinois University, there was a lot of research and a lot of talk about cultural deprivation, and we fought it. We said, we're not culturally deprived, but we didn't understand that we weren't aware of what cultural deprivation actually meant. Because what was meant by the people who brought us the concept was that we were not being exposed to the theater, to the ballet, to the opera, to the humanities, to the finest fine arts, and consequently we were in some way limited. But one day it occurred to me, as I was working on my master's thesis under the mentorship of the ancestor, Dr. Jacob H. Carruthers, that cultural deprivation did not mean being deprived of other people's culture. It meant being deprived of your own culture. So we are culturally deprived. We don't have holistic family organization. We have fragments. We have decapitated families, families whose heads have been taken off. We have amputated families families whose members have been chopped off. Yes, yes, yes. When your president made a presentation at the church and he talked about black men being missing in action and AWOL, I wished 
that I had been in the audience because I would have raised my hand and said, excuse me, Senator, but I know where they are. They are languishing in the prisons. Yes. Yes. They are sleeping in the cemeteries. Yes. They are strung out on drugs. Yes. Yes. So I knew that somehow the story was getting twisted, that we were not understanding what was happening to us. We are being culturally deprived. Yes. We do not have family, holistic family organization. We have fragments and remnants of what we originally had. Our unity is therefore broken and scattered, and consequently, we need to think about how we are going to recover from the process known as the African captive trade transferred into slavery. The third thing that is a force that has divided us and continues to divide us is what I have re-termed missed education. Carter Woodson talks about miseducation. And I have a lot of respect for Carter Woodson. And if it were not for Carter Woodson, we would not have Negro History Week. We would not have Black History Month. We would not have an awareness of our history at all. But Carter Woodson was talking about miseducation, and this is a quote directly from him. He says, the Negro's mind has been brought under the control of his oppressor. The problem of holding the Negro down, therefore, is easily solved. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or to go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his special yes. benefit. Carter Woodson was talking about miseducation, and he talked about the difference between getting a job and making a living, which are two different things. Our children have been taught that you go to school to get a good education so that you can get a good job. And Carter Woodson spent about a chapter in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro talking about how people come from all over the world to where we already are. They look for an opportunity to fill a need, and they go into business, and they never get a good job. They make a living. So that was a very important thing that he pointed out to us, that it is important that we make a living and not just seek to get a job. But what I'm talking about when I say missed education is because I'm looking at the root of the word, which is educere, which means to draw forth out of. Yes. You draw forth out of that which is already there. Yes. If when the black child goes to school, if there is nothing in the school that reflects him, that not even his image is represented, come on, come on. not the values of his family are represented. Toni Morrison did a fine job when she talked in the bluest eye about the Dick and Jane reader. You'd have to be older than you are to know about this reader. Oh, look, look, look. Yeah, I see, Dick. see Dick run. Yeah. Dick can jump. Yeah. Jane can run. This was the first image of the family yes. that the black child ever saw. Yes. This family consisted of mother, father, Dick, yes. Jane, Spot, yes. and Puff. Yes. Spot and Puff were the pets. Father went to, was at home 
when the children went to school. Father was at home when the children returned from school. Mother was in the kitchen with an apron baking cookies. Bot and Puff were the pets of the children, Dick and Jane. They lived in a house with a little white picket fence. And black children had that as their primary reader, and they compared their families with this nuclear family model and thought their families to be deficient. Well, the families were deficient, not because they weren't nuclear families, but because they didn't have all of the mothers that they should have. They didn't have all of the fathers they should have. They didn't have all of the family supporting them and caring for them and providing for them and disciplining them and nurturing them. As they say, it takes a whole village to raise a child. And the village was absent. But our children looked at Dick and Jane and probably aspired to someday grow up. I remember telling people when I grew up I was going to get married and have a boy and a girl. Is there anybody else who told that story? Because that's the family you thought you were supposed to have. What I'm saying is missed education means that when we, our children start to school, there is nothing in the schoolhouse. There is nothing in the school books. There is very little in the curriculum that reflects the black community, the black family. And so consequently, our children are not having anything drawn forth out of them. What I'm calling missed education, what I'm calling what is happening too often, maybe not always, in the schools is that our children are being waterboarded. I'm saying that we are pouring into our children. We are flooding our children with facts and information about others and their exploit and their exceptional behavior. Everything they see when they turn the pages of a social studies book shows them a hero who does not look like them, a heroine that does not look like them. So that when they study whatever subject it is that they're studying, they are being waterboarded with the accomplishments of other people and never being exposed to or seldom being exposed to the accomplishment of their own people. Dr. Margaret Burroughs tried to correct that a little bit in her poem, What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black? of what it means to be captive in this dark skin. What shall I tell my dear ones, fruit of my womb? What shall I tell my children? No one is telling our children in public institutions about who they are, from whence they came, where they are now, what is their purpose, What is their destiny? And if they are not learning that, if they're not being taught back to themselves, then what is being called education is missed education because it's not education at all. So we have forces that divided and are still dividing us But we shall not despair because we have many reasons to think that there is a way back to where from whence we have come because we know or we will know where we have been. James Weldon Johnson and his brother John Rosalind Johnson wrote our anthem the black national anthem, lift every voice and sing, you know it. And whenever they tell us to stand and sing it, we see people looking around because they haven't really studied the words, and so they don't always know the words, especially the 
the end part of the first verse. But the first verse is not the only verse that we should pay attention to. What we must pay attention to are the verses that follow the first verse, because these are our marching songs. These are our marching lyrics. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. Hotep Rashekamad. I suppose I'm I'm a, I'm supposed to stand here and ask for questions, answers, comments whatever it is, and I, I do welcome those because I do feel very good in dialogue more so than in monologue. So this, I'm in my comfort zone now. You can ask me stuff. <laughs> yes? If you stand. This is Fred Carter. He is my doctor's husband. Well, that's a tall order, but this is my approach. My approach to it is that part of the definition of community is a group of people who share values, which means that the community is not necessarily a geographical concept, which means that you may not always find yourself located in your community because your values may not be shared by the people in your community. In turn, that means that you must seek out the community with which you share values. We are never, ever going to make everybody who lives upstairs, next door, down the street, adhere to the same values as long as we continue to live in a, in a situation in which we exercise little control over the images and the content that is being programmed and telegraphed and televised and radioed to us. We're not going to change that. But we can join forces with like-minded people. And we can do what we can to elevate the consciousness of people who do not yet see what it is 
that we think we see so that at some point they may voluntarily care to join us. But we cannot go out as the oppressors did with guns and march people into, into places and give them orders so that you, you function with the community of people with whom you share values. And while you relate to and respect and do your best to live in harmony with those people who have different values, you still know that if you're going to make progress, that is the way things will have to be until enough people are united that things change, and things do change. But we cannot expect to take all of the fragments and sew together a patchwork quilt, Fred. And you know that because look how hard you are trying. Doesn't mean not to try. It means to know as you try what the obstacles are so that you are not repelled by the obstacles that face you. I hope that helps at all. All right. Hmm? No. Right. Well, we want you to go into the camera. Thank you. For your wisdom. And um, I've always been taught since I was a little girl by my mom that in all you're getting, get understanding. Mm -hmm. And as I grew up, I found myself raising, uh, I'm the youngest of seven, and I found myself raising my nieces and nephews, and I ended up adopting two of them. Um, and I never understood why I was put in that position until now. Because now I understand that because these are my biological brothers and sisters' children, that I'm obligated, in a sense, from what I'm learning from you today. And now I understand why, first of all, I don't have any regrets for doing it, but I just never understood why I was put in that position. And now I do, and I want to thank you for giving me understanding and, allow, and helping me to understand why I was blessed to do what I had to do with my brothers and sisters' lives, and my nieces and nephews, my children. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You know, um, I have sisters and brothers, and they have children who are more like me than they are like their biological parents. And I used to tease them before I learned more about African history and culture that uh, they had the wrong children. Um, I was somewhat of a, an activist uh, in my younger days. And my sister was just the, um, the epitome of a very normal, well-behaved young lady. And uh, she never did any revolutionary type stuff. One day, she was watching television, and she saw her son on television. He was down at the city hall in a southern city, nailing 21 demands on the door of the city hall. <laughs> My sister was completely flabbergasted. She could not understand why her child, because she had followed a pattern why her child of all the children in the town was trying to get himself assassinated. Because this was years ago. And I told her, he's my child. That's exactly what a child of mine would do, be right down there trying to make social change, trying to demand social change. And so we finally understood that he was my son and that she had just given birth to him. <laughs> and then I had, my other sister had a daughter. And my other sister was well behaved as well. And her daughter, she took her daughter to uh, 
through the, what's this coming out party thing they do? Cotillion, Cotillion thing, you know. And I, I thought it was somewhat ridiculous, the whole, that whole thing. So I gave my niece a, a little book called The Cotillion, in which she learned what the, the history of the cotillion, which was the cotillion was a, an instrument by which comely black girls were introduced to polite, quote, white society so that white men of property could choose their concubines. So I gave that book to my niece, and she sprouted an Afro, Afro, Afro that rivaled the one that Angela Davis was wearing. <laughs> for you.